My name is Linda Toth, I'm Director of Standards at Conexus, and with me I have Mike Lindberg, who's the Director of Payment Solutions at CHS, which is also the Senex Brands. Mike is also Chair of our Board for Conexus. I also have Kara Gunderson, who is the POS Manager for Citgo Petroleum. She's also the Chair of our Data Security Committee at Conexus and sits on our Board. Um, if you want to live tweet, Mike's handle is up there, and then the Conexus Online handle is up there as well. So before we get into our main presentation, I wanted to spend just a few seconds and talk to you about Conexus. We are an independent nonprofit trade association for convenience and retail fueling. We do many things, among which we set standards. Um, if you use a mobile payment application as a retailer or if you're a consumer and you use a mobile payment application at the pump, chances are it's using the Conexus standard. Um, we are the only vertical that has such a standard and it allows um, our vendors to actually control the site systems to uh, start and stop the pump. So we, we're doing some good things with standards. We also do a lot of education and we also do a lot of advocacy. One thing to note is that we're independent from NACS. So if you have a membership in NACS, it doesn't mean that you're a member of Conexus. Um, we can easily fix that if you come by and talk to us. So today our objectives are to identify pulse possible vulnerabilities in your sites when it comes to data network and payment securities. And then we're also going to explore some technology, equipment, techniques, et cetera, that you can choose to implement. But it's important when we're going through these to realize that you need to use a layered approach. And furthermore, one size does not fit all. So what's going to work for you is probably not what's going to work for the person sitting next to you or even your competitor across the street. You need to make sure that you're choosing solutions that work for your sites and your budget. As I mentioned, you need to use layered security, and we're going to talk about security roughly in these three areas, including people, you know, what you do with your employees, how you train them, processes that you can implement, and then technology that's available to help you out. When it comes to um, card brands, it's really your responsibility to understand what's happening. And there's several organizations out that out there that are setting standards, quote unquote. And these standards relate to accepting payments, but in most cases, the card brands are the ones that are heavily involved in controlling the work output. So these same card brands are then turning around and enforcing these standards. And it's up to you to understand the regulations, the liability shifts, because it's all on you, the merchants. It's your responsibility. There's two bodies in particular um, that do this. One is EMV Co. They're the folks that have the standard for the EMV chip card. They also do things like tokenization, 3D secure, secure remote commerce. The other organization is PCI, and we're going to talk about both of these in a little bit greater detail. But PCI actually sets standards um, that protect from data breaches and the data inside the cardholder data environment. And all of these organizations are controlled by the card brands, Visa, MasterCard, Discover, Amex, and JCB. So when we look at EMV, and honestly, we could spend a whole hour just on EMV. We're not going to, but I think it's important to kind of level set on EMV. Remember that EMV is a liability shift. It's not a mandate. However, if you're branded, your fuel supplier may be requiring you to upgrade to EMV, and it's also a common sense mandate. Remember that fraud migrates to the path of least resistance, and you don't want to be the last one standing that's not taking EMV, because all of the fraud will come to you. Everything except automated fueling dispensers went into effect already. The AFD date has been pushed out to October 2020. It's fast approaching. I urge you not to drag your feet on this. And just because the date has been moved out to 2020 doesn't mean you're completely off the hook when it comes to AFDs. In fact, if you're in an area of high tourism, for example, that you take non-domestic issued cards, any fraud on those cards, you're on the hook for today. If you have excessive fraud at your sites, you may be under chargeback rules today. So just because the date is 2020 doesn't mean that you're off the hook completely. 
I know you probably have a lot of questions about EMV, and again, as I said, we can't really get into um, very much detail, so instead I'm going to leave you with these resources about EMV. These are great resources. They're all free. That's even better. Um, there's an EMV resource paper that our RFT committee put together, Retail Financial Transactions. You could find it at that URL. What we did was scoured all of the organizations that are involved with EMV, and we took the best of the best. So this paper references webinars, white papers, et cetera, by topic, so that you can go out and, and listen to webinars, read white papers about things that you're concerned about and need to know how to implement. Connexus also does a monthly webinar. We've done quite a few on EMV in August of this year, just a couple months ago. We did one on outdoor EMV. So I encourage you to go out to connexus.org slash webinars and listen to that. Got a lot of good information. If you're not on our mailing list for webinars, just send us an email at webinars at connexus.org and we'll be happy to get you on that list. There's also a FAQ section on our website and we've got some information on EMV there. Um, the expo opens up this afternoon across the way in the convention center. We're at 6147. We partner with NAX to anchor the Tech Edge Solution Center. Come by and we'd be happy to talk to you about it. Also, while you're here, make sure you're taking advantage of visiting with your vendors. They're the people that are going to be able to tell you their roadmap, you know, the, when they're going to have solutions available for you, and, and what kind of upgrades you're looking at. So next, I'd like to turn this over to Mike to talk about PCI. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. So uh, payment security is a responsibility of all entities that transmit, store, or process cardholder data. The payment card, uh, payment card industry basically has a security standards body called uh, the payment, excuse me, uh, payment data card that sets a set of standards that everyone has to abide by. So terminal manufacturers on the left actually have to follow PCI PTS or PIN transaction security Software developers or payment applications actually have to follow PADSS or payment application data security standards. And on the right hand side, all merchants and service providers must follow PCI DSS or payment card industry data security standards. In order to be compliant, all three of those must be in place to achieve security and compliance. Next, let's take a look at the PCI just at a very high level, the data security standards. It's a set of 12 requirements that basically put in security controls to help protect against cardholder data and sensitive authentication data being lifted. So through the process, there's actually people, process, and technology that are put together to help you protect against data breaches. So now for a little more on data breaches, I'm going to turn it over to Cara, and she'll give us some statistics on data breaches. Thanks, Mike. So I don't, is my mic on? OK, thank you. So here's what we know about data breaches so far is that the attackers are incredibly effective and they're becoming more effective every day. That's why we have to continually upgrade our systems. 77% are coming from organized crime, meaning it could be state or country sponsored attackers. We also know that they're very, very well funded. They're very well organized. A lot of you have heard of the dark web. That's where they actually have ready-made tools to help attackers attack your systems. In 2017, 2.6 billion records were compromised. That means a total of 1,765 events were recorded. And who knows how many were not recorded. So you have to ask yourself, can you afford a data breach? The small and medium business, which, is, which accounts for over 60% of the NAC's ownership of convenience stores, is not NAX ownership, but NAX reported ownership of single store convenience stores is, falls into that small and medium business category. The average is $120,000. That's already in 2018, and that's up 36% over 2017. What do they want? I realize this is kind of an eyesore, but really they're looking for personally identifiable information. We call that PII. They want to, do, they want to create accounts and cards so that they can get more funding. 28% of them want payment card information. Again, it's all financially motivated. Of those attacks, 34% are installing ransomware, and we'll get into ransomware in just a little bit. But the latest is what they call crypto jacking. And when, it, when you think about the fact that it takes them, the attacker almost one year 
and a ton of electricity and computing power to, make, to, to crypto mine one Bitcoin. In the state of Louisiana, which has one of the lowest costs for electricity, that's $3,224 to, to crypto mine one Bitcoin. Plus, they need computing power. So they're not, only go, they're not only getting into your systems to get the data, but they want to get into the enterprise systems to use your electricity and your computing power. By the way, Hawaii is at the highest at $9,500. All right. Now back to Linda. Sorry. Thanks. Um, so today we're going to bring you a series of fraud case or fraud use case studies. And um, through these use case studies, we're going to point out some of the vulnerabilities that you're facing and give you some possible solutions to either avoid them, mitigate them, or rectify them. And to protect the innocent, we've changed the names of all of these use cases to ABC Oil. ABC Oil is a typical um, retailer in our industry. They've got 20 plus convenience stores and all of the stores are networked together. They all go back to the uh, headquarters and they have a corporate network. So they're doing email in the cloud. They've got office programs in the cloud. Um, they share data and files in the cloud and they also import vendor invoices. Um, and then they've also got connections to all of their stores. So they're looking at tank monitoring, fuel dispatching. Um, they bring in all of their back office data to do reconciliation and accounting. And they're also monitoring the video surveillance. We're going to concentrate on one of the stores, ABC store number five. And this is a typical day in that convenience store, much like yours. We've got a happy cashier busy serving customers, people on their way to work and school, buying snacks, coffee, et cetera. Um, she's got a, a POS system. This isn't anybody's particular POS system. It's meant to be generic. And it just so happens she has a pump eight offline message. In addition, she's got a uh, delivery, a direct store delivery yeah. driver that's coming into the store. He's delivering product to the shelves and anything that's left over he puts in the, the back office or the back room so that they can stock shelves. And then we have a pump technician coming in. So uh, now that we've set this all up, we're going to turn to Channel 6 News, where reporter Gray Taylor has just reported that corporate <laughs> files have been encrypted. And I'm going to turn this over to Cara, who's going to explain this use case to us. Thank you, Linda. So our first fraud case study today is on ransomware. So here we have ABC Oil Company, and um, they are doing email in the cloud. They have their office programs in the cloud. They have, they're, they're encouraging employees to be on social media to promote ABC Oil Company. They're dispatching fuel. They're also connecting to their bank to get credit card settlement, uploading payroll files, and what have you. Next, we have ABC Oil Company. And of course, they have their point of sale, their back office, tank monitoring, video monitoring. They are also connected up to ABC Oil Company for all of that information. Um, conversely, ABC Oil Company also has the ability to remote back into all of their stores if needed. And like the corporate office, they're able to, uh, the employees are able to get on social media. They also need the office and the email in the cloud to do their business. Once the attacker identifies their target, they start monitoring their targets on social media because they want to start spear phishing and try and get sensitive data to get into your network. So they're looking for things such as Chris.Smith at a specific domain name or ABC O a company. And in this particular case, the attacker pretends that he's Chris Smith and he comes up and sends a fraudulent email to ABC store number five. And not only that, but then the attacker follows it up with a phone call and says, hey, Pat, store owner, this is Chris from the corporate office. Please make sure you see the email I just sent you so that you don't get locked out of the server. So Pat, being the good employee, says, yep, Chris has called me. This must be important. Clicks on the email. And guess what? The attacker's in your system. There's a thousand things they could do. The attacker's now gained access to their data, they've installed ransomware, and they've encrypted their files. This is an example of what an email might look like. You do not want this. And what do they want? They want ransomware. So ABC Oil Company is now shut down. They can't dispatch fuel. They can't access files, cannot email. No sales data, no payroll. They're unable to conduct business. 
Folks, if you think that this is unrealistic, this is actually a true story and this happened. And folks, I'm hearing of companies who've not only been, had their data encrypted once, but twice until they finally shut it off and closed the openings. The attackers want finances, so they want ransom in Bitcoin. As of September 21st, it was trading at $6,702. Just a quick show of hands, how many people have been attacked or know of someone who's had this happen to them? It's pretty daunting, isn't it? There's a lot of hands in the room. So folks, it's not only payment card data, they're looking to encrypt your files to gain financing. So how could you avoid this attack? So the, the very popular Office program that we all know and love has a couple of packages that you can add on. It's called multi-factor multi authentication and threat intelligence packages. What is multi-factor authentication? It is something that you know, something that you have, and something that you are. So in addition to using multi-factor authentication for all of your cloud access, because remember, everybody in the globe has access to your information when you're in the cloud. Limit your internet access to business only. Don't allow employees on social media. They don't need to, to look at their bank account while they're supposed to be working. And train your employees about phishing. And I want to talk about phishing for a little bit. So what is it? It is fraudulent attempts for sensitive information. Because remember, they're trying to get you to enter your information to gain access to the network. This is why phishing scams keep working. It says, enter your bank account number. Dilbert says, scam. Then he sends it to the next gal. She says, scam. Sends it to the third person. He's like, OK, they must really need it. OK? Folks, it looks very, very authentic. So be sure that you're watching and you're training. Another thing you can do is add external notation to all of your emails. Because in the, in the fraudulent email that the, that the um, attacker sent would have been from the outside. So it would have been labeled as, ex as external. And you, and you would know that Chris Smith emailing you from the outside is not feasible. This is probably one of the newer things that we're starting to see evolve in the industry, and that's managed detection and reporting. And I call it smart logging. So we do the traditional logging today that we get from our firewall providers and our firewall companies. And, um, but there's a great webinar that we had as part of um, the Connexus webinar series earlier this spring on managed detection and reporting, and it's called Leverage Data Science to Improve Data Security. Folks, if you're not familiar with MDNR, please go view that webinar. You can go to connexus.org to see it, or you can go to YouTube and uh, search by Connexus. But that is a great webinar to learn more about managed detection and reporting. Folks, it is the next step and imperative that we do this. Protect all your business and all of your data as if it was payment card information. Contract with a managed firewall provider for data security and logging service that includes your security incident and event management, which is what you're doing today, take that next step and enroll in MDNR. Remember, firewall is your number one PCI compliance requirement. Back up your files daily, because you know what? If your files, if you are attacked and your files are encrypted, you have the ability to restore your files and not have to pay that ransom that they're requiring. I want to go back to phishing for just a little bit, because for those of you that may not be familiar with phishing, there's some commonalities that we see in these spear phishing events. So for instance, there's grammatical errors, there's strange punctuation, and there's unknown domain names. McGill University provides a great um, example here where they're trying to get you to click on a, what is a fraudulent share folder. In addition, this next one is uh, a fraudulent PayPal login. Uh, it's not, oh, thank, oh, sorry, it's not that one yet. Um, this, is, this looks very, very familiar and very legitimate, but review before you sign in, because at the top, I know you can't see it, but it's a suspicious internet act address. It looks to me like it's from Germany. So, um, and then finally, the PayPal example that I was talking about. Again, one of the tricks that you can do is take your mouse and hover over that link, and it will have a little pop-up, and it will tell you where that's coming from, and that'll be helpful for you to, to identify whether or not that is legitimate. Folks, we don't want to have this happen, where the IT guy comes in to the boss and says, well, our devices are now 100% secure. He says, how'd you do it? He says, I turned them all off. 
We can't run our business that way. So train your employees on phishing. The human factor is still the highest source of weakness, contributing to more than half of such compromises. And train the in-store employees, too. 46.5 million phishing attempts were made in just the second quarter of 2017. That's just three months' time, folks. And then, out of those phishing attacks, 47% were able to compromise POS systems, point-of-sale systems, due to improper segmentation. Your firewall provider can help you with that segmentation. This is probably my favorite cartoon. So it, it says data security. In the left corner, we have firewalls, encryption, antivirus software, et cetera. And in this other corner, we have Dave. Folks, don't be a Dave. You have to ask yourself, who is watching and protecting your network? So to recap, using our layered data security approach, look before you click, log all your network activity, install a managed firewall. Remember, that's PCI compliance rule number one, and back up your system. Oh, no, Gray's back. From Channel 6, over 20,000 credit cards have been compromised. The Secret Service investigates. Mike. Tell us more. Sure. Our next fraud case we're going to look at is remote access. So ABC Oil uses a third-party technician to actually support their payment, their point of sale, and their pumps. Well, the technician actually installed a, a, a remote access system so they could actually access the location, this point of sale, and their pumps without actually having to physically travel to the location. So this actually saves quite a bit of money and travel time that they actually don't have to travel to the sites. Well, the problem is the technician installed this remote access unsecurely. And according to the uh, PCI Security Council, insecure remote access is the number one entry point for brick and mortar attacks against payment systems. So let's take a look at what happened. So ABCI Oil, the technician actually installed the software and left it always on. They also use the same username and password, very common one, for all 20 locations. So as hackers are scanning the internet, they were actually able to find this insecure remote access. And one thing to keep in mind, anything that's on the internet, it can be scanned. And if you have a vulnerability, it can be found. So they actually were able to find the locations. Next, once they're in, they actually took malware figured out what point of sale ABC Oil had, and installed it on the system. From there, the RAM scraping malware actually captured the credit card data, encrypted, encrypted it, and then exfiltrated out of the network without ABC Oil Company even knowing this was going on. So how could ABC Oil prevent this? Well, let's first look at actual remote access logging in. Only enable remote access when needed. Change your username and passwords. Don't use the default. Don't use common passwords. Then also, once again, multi-factor authentication. Something you know, a password. Something you have, a device. And something you are, a biometric. Finally, use unique credentials per location. Insist your vendors do this. A lot of vendors actually will use the same username and password for all their customers and all of your locations. Insist they use unique passwords. Next, let's take a look at the remote application itself. Always make sure you're on the latest version of remote access software and that it's fully patched. Also make sure your point of sale is on a latest supported operating system and those latest security patches are installed. Finally, enable logging inside your remote access application. And enabling logging is not enough. You actually have to have someone looking at the logging, looking for strange activity, uh, you know, looking for someone maybe connecting that wasn't authorized at a specific time. And finally, let's take a look at the firewall. So enable your firewalls to only allow remote access from known IP addresses. So only the, when the scanning's happening, they wouldn't, if they were actually able to find it, they wouldn't be able to get in because the firewall would actually block them. Another thing that actually you can do also, too, is the quarterly scans, internal and external vulnerability scans, they not necessarily won't find the easy username and password, but they'll let you know what you have open, and so it actually can be reviewed 
Uh, and you should also do, PCI also has, you should actually do those uh, scans anytime you, quarterly and anytime you have a significant change in your infrastructure. So to recap with the layered approach, limit the use of remote access, limit the IP addresses that can access, that actually can use the remote access in, use multi-factor authentication, Use the latest patch software for both your remote access and your point of sale, and then enable logging and review it regularly. So next, oh no, gray, we've got a skimmer found at ABC Oil, store number five. The police are warning all the customers to check their credit card bills. Linda, what happened? Well, in this case, we had an imposter technician. So remember that guy who was coming to work on the pumps? He really wasn't an authorized technician. He was an imposter, and he ended up installing a skimming device. Um, a skimming device is used to steal account information. And we know that automated fueling dispensers are prime targets. Remember, we were talking about EMV. As that window of EMV is closing, the mag stripe data, that track data off the back of the card, that black stripe, that's what they're skimming. And as EMV becomes more and more prevalent, then that mag stripe data loses its value because there's less places you can use it at. So AFDs are really becoming a prime target. Don't forget about your indoor terminals and also your ATMs, though. Um, and again, skimming is on the rise due to EMV deployment. So here's an example of an inline skimmer. The uh, picture on the left is a close-up. The picture on the right is where it's actually installed. This is a really important reason why you should take before and after, or before photos at least. Um, when you open up a dispenser, there's lots of cables, there's lots of electronics, and it's really hard to detect this thing. Um, you can see on the picture on the right, you were looking at the back, it's an encapsulated um, microprocessor with the cable, and this is actually numbered. The thieves do this a lot. They'll number them so that they can keep track of them. It used to be that they had to return to the store to pick these up. They don't have to do that anymore because now they are using Bluetooth. So they can sit in your parking lot, across the street, nearby, and, and actually retain or uh, retrieve the data. So very important that um, you, we, uh, we take before pictures so you know what it's supposed to look like. These are card reader skimmers. The picture on the very left is the original, and then the picture on the middle is where the card reader was actually put on top of it. And you can see that it's jutting out from that alcove. That's a good way to see that something's not right, and this is a great example of a before picture, and then looking at it, and you can easily spot the difference. The picture on the right is another example of a card skimmer that's been just overlaid on it. I actually kind of photoshopped out the logo. There was a logo on this, and it was very obvious when the uh, skimmer was put on top, the logo got cut off, you know, it wrapped around the card reader. So if you have any kind of logo or sticker on it, that's another easy way to detect that a skimmer's there. The other thing is kind of jiggle these skimmers. A lot of times they'll be a little, or the, sorry, the reader, it'll be a little bit loose, and, and that's a good sign that you have a skimmer. Um, I talked a little bit about ATM skimmers. Um, the picture on the left is the card reader. Remember with an ATM, it's typically debit cards, so you're looking for card data and pins. So the picture on the left is how they get the card data. The pictures on the right, the, the, the middle one there, that's an overlay uh, key, keypad. The picture on the far right is actually a pinhole camera that they've located in a literature rack, and it's pointed at the screen and the keypad, so they can report, record those synchronously so they can see what prompts and what data are being entered. Great way to get a pin. So how could it have been prevented? In this case, we had an imposter technician, and the cashier failed to identify that this guy was legit. So identify everybody who comes in your store telling you that, that they're there to work or to uh, you know, do anything. Um, deliver product, whatever, identify people. If you've got people that are working to do repair or maintenance, use a visitor log. Um, make sure you record the date, the time they came in, when they left, who they were, who they were with, what they were working on, and if um, you keep this log, have the cashier or whoever checked them in sign it. That, that gives a little bit of onus on whoever checked the ID to actually check it. Um, so how can skimming be prevented? If you don't have um, anything in place, this is a great place to start. We partnered with NACS for the We Care program. If you go out to our website, you'll find some white papers on education. Um, 
We also, NAC sells the serialized labels, such as um, the We Care labels. There's other companies that sell these. If you are branded, your fuel supplier may have labels for you. You can buy them from your distributor. You can buy them um, at NAC's, but use them. Put them in the right spot. It doesn't do any good if they're not in the right spot. And then finally, you have to inspect these. It's no good to just put them on and leave them. You should be inspecting these on a regular basis, whether it's on a shift change or daily. The picture on the right shows when the sticker has been um, lifted up. It shows void on it. You also need to check the serial number. It's not important. It's not it's not just that the label's there, but it's the right. same label as there. And NAC's actually partnered with Pinnacle for a Skim Defend application. It's free in the, um, for Android and Apple for if you have just a couple sites. And I think the, the pricing is pretty reasonable if you have more. But this allows your cashiers just to scan these labels. And if something is different, it'll alert you. So that's a great way to do um, serial monitoring. Um, some other easy things you can do, change your dispenser locks. We recommend unique locks per site, not across all your sites. Make sure you've got good surveillance out there. Make sure your lighting is good. You know, the, the pumps on the back side of your forecourt are prime targets because the cashier can't see what's going on out there, and lighting discourages thieves. And then remember that a lot of the skimmers are in line, so they're you know, messing potentially with some of those signals that are going back and forth. So you may see bad card reads or dispenser offline messages like our cashier did earlier. Um, and a, a couple other things, a lot of the newer dispensers have dispenser access alarms. Um, these can also be, there, there are some solutions out there that can actually shut down your dispensers when unauthorized access is detected. Sometimes the POS, uh, you know, the cashier can bring this back up. In other cases, it's set so that the home office has to intervene. And that's great in case you have a cashier that's taken a bribe from a thief. Um, these are more expensive, but again, you need to make sure that you're implementing technology and solutions that are appropriate for your site. If you're in Florida on I-95, I would encourage this. If you're, you know, middle of the Corn Belt, maybe you don't need to go this far. Um, another thing to consider is secure card readers and encrypting pin pads, and you can talk to your vendors about those solutions. So again, a layered data uh, security approach. Make sure you're IDing and logging all your visitors. Make sure you have good lighting and video. Make sure your dispensers are secure, whether you're using some advanced technology or, or just the weak hair labels, and inspect often for skimming. So next, we have uh, Channel 6 back, breaking news. A card skimmer has been installed in seconds, and an overlay skimmer was used to capture card numbers and pins. And I'm going to turn this back over to Mike to explain what happened. Thanks, Linda. So our next fraud case study is on indoor skimmers. So let's go back to ABC Oil. If you look at the pin pad in the middle of the picture there, an overlay skimmer, like the one on the right, was placed over top. Now, ABC Oil, at this point, has chosen not to implement EMV. So let's go to the next slide, and let's take a video of an, of an overlay skimmer actually being installed. Okay, how many of you saw that? <laughs> how many of you didn't see that? I mean, it, it's very difficult to see. Now let's take a picture, uh, let's go through. This is, this is the actual overlay that was installed in that video. Once you know what you're looking for, it's a lot easier to detect. So let's watch the video one more time. So he's pulling it out of his jacket right here, snapping it on right there, and the skimmer's installed, and notice that the cashier has no idea that an overlay skimmer was just put on top of the terminal. So how could ABC Oil prevented this? Well, the first thing that we actually do with our brand is we recommend putting a sticker, a serialized security sticker, on the back side of the terminal that actually faces the cashier. And each terminal is a little bit different, and the style of overlay that might go across is a little bit different. So for this terminal, the ideal position is right on the back side. So if a skimmer overlay is put over top, part of the sticker disappears, and it's an easy check to make sure that, it's, that an overlay is not installed. Next, secure your pin pads and inventory your pin pads. So secure them to the counter. This prevents against substitution about someone coming in and swapping, actually swapping out your pin pad. Finally, taking pictures. 
looking for unusual marks. Um, what chords? I mean, how many, how many of you realize what chords are plugged into the back of your pin pad? Uh, there's a couple ports. What if someone actually plugs something in the back side of one of these pin pads and you have no idea what it is? Take pictures so for comparison. Finally, train your employees on what to look for. The stickers, um, different marks on the pin pads, what cables are plugged in. And then finally, what should you do if there is a skimmer on a pin pad or outside or any of these scenarios? Uh, having an incident response plan and having your employees trained is a really big step on knowing what to do. So let's take a, a quicker look at how to spot overlay skimmers. So on the right hand side is the overlay skimmer on this type of model. So that actually just snaps on over the terminal um, and then usually with a gentle tug they'll actually come loose. So if you look here, most times it goes back to the overlay it needs to be thicker and bigger because it's going over top. So if you look at the red bracketed bars are much larger on the left hand side than they are on the right because um, essentially it has to go over top. Then also too, look for your pin pad, the backlighting. Uh, the skimmers don't have the power to actually have the backlight and the keypads like the terminals do nowadays. So that's another tip off that you actually have an overlay. Then also look for lights on your pin pads. A lot of times the, the overlays will actually cover up the lights and that's another indication to train your store personnel. And finally, also here's a great example that the actual overlay covered up the stylus tray so it looks a little bit different in this scenario. So a lot of different things to look for but a lot of triggers to, to alert you to an overlay. So from a layered security approach, the serialized security stickers locking your pin pads down, inventorying to prevent against substitution, and then training your employees on what to do, how to spot one, and then what to do if they do find one. So with that, uh-oh, Gray's back. This time we have a full-on data breach. Not just payment data was lost, but this time loyalty information was exposed. Carl, what happened? Oh, Mike, it was an inside job. That's all I can tell you. So here we have our direct sales deliver, your DSD driver. He delivers your products, he stacks the coolers in the shelves, and he leaves the extra product. And he leaves the extra product in the back office, and folks, this looks a lot like every back office I've ever been in, I don't know about yours, but um, that's where product storage, kitchen prep, your manager's office, your back office PC. In addition, we've got um, internet router, you've got your point of sale server, firewall, site controller, everything that could be volatile is back there as well. Unfortunately, this driver is pretty technologically savvy. And, and he knows that um, if he logs into the site controller, he could possibly get elsewhere in your system. And not only does he log in, but then he's, he realizes that the default passwords were never changed. So from there, unfortunately, he goes from the site controller to the electronic payment server. And folks, this can happen and we've proven it in our lab, okay? So the, uh, the attacker takes a thumb, thumb drive, puts it in the USB port of the electronic payment server, which goes to the point of sale server. In the meantime, they're still processing payment card and loyalty transactions, and guess what? You got a data breach because everything's been captured on that thumb drive. What could you do? Change default passwords. Folks, PCI requirement number two, change default passwords. Use a combination of upper and lowercase letters, numbers, special characters. In addition, log everything. This is PCI requirement number 10. Your firewall provider can help you logging your point of sale system logs, your network logs. Make sure every device in your store is plugged in to that firewall. You don't want your tank monitoring to go outside of your firewall. Everything should go through your firewall. Visitors log, Linda's already talked about that as well. Log everybody. Don't forget to, to also note this, the, the uh, pump numbers that they've worked on. Physical protection is PCI requirement number nine. You have to physically protect your environment. Lock your office. Escort non-employees in unauthorized areas. Lock all those devices up that are in that back office that that tech had access to, or the, the DSC driver had access to. Protect data from everybody. That's your drivers, even technicians, because it could be imposters. 28% of the tax come from internal sources. Make sure that you're also watching your employees. And we all know in this business, by distracting our cashiers, 
That's usually when a lot of the scammers can happen. And folks, they're not only doing that, but Mike talked about locking down your pin pad so they can't swap that out, can't put a skimmer on and, and your point of sale device. So using that layered security approach again, change all your default passwords, log everything, log your systems, log people, lock systems, lock your office, and escort visitors. Oh no, Gray is back again. If you guys don't know Gray Taylor, he is the executive director of Connexus, so that's why we're kind of picking on him. And attackers now steal 600 gallons of fuel. They used a remote device. Tell us more, Mike. Sure, our next, our final fraud case study is on something called standalone mode. Okay, so if you remember back in the beginning, Linda mentioned that pump eight was offline. There was several customers in the store, so the clerks just kind of blew it off and, and went about their business. Well, finally, they looked out and they saw customers going to pump eight, purchasing fuel and driving off without paying. No alerts were going off, just the fact that Pump 8 was offline. So what happened? Well, an actual person came out and put Pump Number 8 in standalone mode. Okay? This is one that it was kind of the first time I heard about this. Uh, I was like, really, that can happen? And then uh, the more I started looking around, I actually have three stories of this happened, and one was actually uh, uh, across the nation in actually one of the, all the newspapers and online. So if you look at that, what is standalone mode? Well, it actually goes back to full service days when all the fuel pumps were not connected to the point of sale. You had your service technicians out pumping fuel and they actually picked up the handle and pumped the fuel. There was no authorizations and that's the way everything worked. Well, this is actually still in all the point of sales and the pumps and that's because if you actually lose your point of sale, you can go and put your pumps in standalone mode and continue to dispatch fuel and most people actually don't even know that. Now I'm not going to get into the details of how to do that, and uh, we don't want to get that out from the fraudsters. <laughs> we don't want to but them, no. <laughs> so how could have ABC Oil prevented this? Oh, women, no. Actually, let's do this first. Think about this: What would have been the outcome of your store of, of, of a pump offline? Would your clerks acted quickly, and maybe you had a 50-gallon loss, or would it have taken them longer because they have so much going on, and maybe didn't know what to do? Maybe they didn't know how to turn a pump off, an individual pump off, and maybe you lose 500 gallons. Or would your employees actually close the store and have gone home because you actually ran out of fuel? <laughs> That'd be bad. So, so how to prevent? Now it's the same prevention, so I won't go into detail of how to prevent outdoor skimming. You know, changing the locks, the serialized security st stickers, the inspection to look for tampering, and then training these employees. But one of the key differences here is actually changing the default codes on your fuel pumps. Most people don't even know that this is available. On one model, there's actually a pin pad on the inside of the terminal. Another major manufacturer uses it a remote. And if they don't change the default codes in there, that's one of the steps to actually put your pump into this standalone mode. So we recommend to actually have them change that. It's something they don't do, and each model of pump does have a different code, but it's something we recommend. Also, if you have remote locations that maybe don't have an inside of a store, if you don't do this, there's no one to, you know, to let a pump know that it went offline. So standalone pumps, this is highly encouraged also. Very easy to do. Also, one thing I want to add is the newer pumps have a lot more security features to prevent this happening. So if you have older pumps, it's even more important to change those default access codes. So from a, a layered data security approach, change those dispenser locks, apply the stickers, have your technicians change the default codes, and then train your employees. Make sure you train them not only on all the things we talked about, but what to do if this happens. Uh, I don't know, going back to the training, a lot of people I talked to, and actually one of the events happened, the employees that did not know how to turn a single pump off. So finally, after losing the 600 gallons, they actually had to shut all the pumps off with the master switch because no one knew how to turn one pump down. Turning all the pumps off, you can't pump fuel, and how do you sit and troubleshoot? So, From there, I'll turn it over to Linda for some closing thoughts. All right, and after the closing thoughts, we'll have some time for Q&A, so stay put if you have some questions. All right, so closing thoughts and key takeaways. Um, 
have an incident response plan. You know, when it comes to security and breaches and skimming, it's probably not if, but when. It's very prevalent, and if you haven't been hit yet, there's a high likelihood that you will. You need to know what to do. When you find something is not the time to figure out who to call. So have a response plan. Know what the card brands require. There's a lot of rules out there in terms of, you know, from MasterCard and Visa. Um, just, it's up to you to know what the requirements are. You can leverage your uh, fuel suppliers to help you with that, but it's your responsibility if you're taking payment debit credit cards. And then know what makes sense on top of that. A lot of the things we talked about aren't requirements, but they may make sense in your particular situation depending on where you're located and your particular budget. And then make sure you use a layered approach. Again, what makes sense for your sites and your budget. And then finally, make sure that you're leveraging resources. There's a lot of resources out there on our website. Uh, MasterCard and Visa have a lot of resources. Your vendors have a lot of resources. Um, PCI has some great resources out there for small merchants. This is an, an example of an infographic that they did. And I know this is very hard to read. Um, the URL is that uh, slash small merchant. A couple of the things that they've pointed out here is that insecure remote access is the number one way for attacks. We've talked about that. Um, lack of software patches accounts for 80% of the problems and weak or stolen passwords are also about 81%. So again, some really simple things you can do, um, but great resources out on PCI, so make sure you are leveraging that as well. So again, layered security. You need to pick some things from people, train your, ca you know, train your cashiers and your employees, make sure you're putting processes in place to protect yourself and utilize technology to help you. Um, you know, at the end of the day, what we're really trying to do is keep you out of the news. Um, and in this case, no news is good news. Finally, ABC Oil has, has fixed up their problems and there's nothing else to report. So, you know, no news is good news and that sort should be your mantra. You don't want to be on the evening news. So with that, we'll be happy to take some questions. We have about 10 or 15 minutes. There's mics uh, towards the front and the middle. <coughs> I have a question about the third party access. Um, what do you recommend in our stores when we're open 24 hours a day and our third party vendors, or more specifically our POS vendors, have to have access 24 hours a day and their access is not inside out. They've got programs running on the inside that get out to them and then allow them back in. So what do you recommend on either restricting them or tracking uh, what they're doing, especially in these late hours when you don't necessarily have a CSR who's gonna question that they just need help do you want to take that one sure well one of the things in that scenario i mean going back to uh, i'd look at segmentation a segment in the zones of where you have important data off to the side and on the reverse side of that one of the pci things is that no external access should be on 24 7. it should only be turned on and it should actually be turned on by an individual if you look a lot of the vpns and other things that are actually into the payment space uh, you actually have to do something on a lot of the major point of sales to actually open that up. But part of that is locking down and just opening up those. I know it's a lot more work, but think about this. If it's easy for your employees to get in, it's probably easy for a hacker to get in also. And I, I also think that you're seeing some, some of the point of sale companies make some changes in their infrastructure forthcoming to help reduce that vulnerability as well. Other questions? Don't be shy. You have some great brains to pick here. <laughs> sure, you want to talk about it was point to point encryption on top of EMV. Sure, so uh, I'll take point to point encryption first. So in the petroleum space, uh, we've been looking at point-to-point -point encryption year after year. And what's different in that is fleet cards, uh, Visa, MasterCard specifically. There's extra prompting data that makes point-to-point -point encryption very difficult. Um, we've actually, working with the PCI Council, we're working with Conexus on the Conexus standard. Uh, we're trying to figure out of how to get some of that implemented. Uh, we're also working with a lot of the terminal vendors, and they're actually finally getting to a place 
uh, with key management and some of the things with whitelisting that I would say within the next year you'll probably see the first point-to-point uh, -point encryption in the petroleum space. Uh, us, we actually have with one of our software vendors, we actually have an indoor solution We've in our lab. We haven't put it out in the field, but we haven't figured out the pumps yet. And once again, now you have different pin pads in the pumps and think of all the pin pads in the pumps and the secure card readers. It's just a very onerous, so it's going to take some time to get there, but we are working on that. Uh, once again, then with EMV, you know, we do recommend EMV to, to get away from the, the counterfeit fraud. Um, you know, it's kind of one of those things you're seeing a lot more, but it did take in the petroleum space, just because of all the uniqueness we have, a lot longer to get EMV out there. Uh, you're actually, I think you were up to probably five major brands that I know, or maybe six, that actually are, have a few sites that are actually outdoor at the pump now. So I would say in the next year, you're going to start seeing outdoor EMV at the pump um, at a lot of locations, especially in the major metropolitan areas first, then moving to the rural, brand, rural areas after that. So. Yeah, and I think another thing that the EMV upgrades bring us are our S-RED dispensers, in, or excuse me, S-RED pin pads, and we have to have that technology in place to be able to, to implement point-to-point -point encryption. So that's, that's also another big benefit for going to EMV because with those S-RED pin pads, that's gonna help you get there that much faster because that's, that's the technology and the pin pads that you need to implement point-to-point -point encryption. Yeah, the, the S-RED actually securely encrypts it upon swipe, so that's, what, that's yeah. basically what Cara is mentioning here. And that goes back to upgrading to encrypted pin pads and secure card readers with that S-RED. And that goes back to the whole PCI side, that pin transaction security. They're at PTS level five right now and uh, a lot of the pumps around that are, have these card, kim or card skimmers are actually not even certified. So they're not, they're not encrypting on swipe, but a lot of the newer stuff does back to the controller board and the pumps. So just by upgrading the technology to the newer secure card readers encrypted pin pads, you're protecting against, um, to me it's 100% of the skimmers. I have not seen a skimmer in any of our locations today, knock on wood, that wouldn't have been prevented by a secure card reader right. and encrypted pin pad. Yeah. And I would add on, Mike mentioned that we just opened up the point-to-point -point spec at Connexus. So we do have a point-to-point -point spec that's unique to petroleum because of fleet. And Sharon's group with Retail Financial Transaction is opening that back up because PCI doesn't recognize certain architectures within it. So we have some QSAs that are working back with uh, PCI to kind of resolve that. But I would encourage anybody that's interested in a solution or, or making sure that the vendors are capable of doing it, join us. Without you at the table, we may not be able to complete the work just because everybody at the table has an equal say. So it's really important that you get involved. Um, membership is not very much, especially if you're a retailer, um, compared to what you get back. CARA's group does a great job of education, um, you know, some roundtable discussion as far as, you know, what the brands are up to, what PCI is up to. So really and truly join us and uh, help us complete the work. Yeah, yeah. Conexus is not just, I mean, this, the, 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 the standards are the biggest part, but, you know, in, in my network, I actually get more out of CARA's group, the data uh, security standards group. Uh, a lot of some of the brightest, smartest security people across, and we also have a lot of PCI qualified security assessors in there. So we actually have people on both sides coming together to solve security for retail petroleum. I had uh, two things. One was uh, I'd like to alert people that on your, uh, you should just stand alone. On the old pumps, all you had to do is change your code on your entry level standalone because you had to step up. But on the newer dispensers, you can go right into level two or level three programming. So you have to actually change your, your code on each one of those to be Thank safe. You. Yes, I didn't want to get into too much because once again, um, if it, you know, right now it's the technicians that know how to do this. And if we start telling everyone how to do it, the next thing you know, everyone's going to know how to hack a pump and turn it into standalone mode. And that's the last thing I wanted to do. <laughs> Thank you. And I had a, a question. You mentioned that on the EMV at, uh, the EMV at dispensers coming soon. Um, when we do that, do we need to upgrade our bandwidth to be able to handle those large packets of information? Possibly. Yeah. Um, sure. What you're going to need to do is talk with your vendors compared to what equipment you already have installed. Um, in most cases, you're probably going to have to upgrade some wiring. 
but it really depends on the age of your dispensers and whether or not you can get by. You know, in some cases, you're going to have to replace equipment. Sometimes you can get by with a retrofit kit. There's a whole lot of considerations when we're talking about installing EMV at the pump. The webinar that we just had in August goes through a lot of that information. I would, I would encourage you to take advantage of that. Yeah, one of the new things coming up, and this is nice about pushing out the delay because we don't have the software ready, we don't have the hardware. Some of the things coming out now, you know, you have your, your, your two wire, you've got your Cat5, but another thing you may see on the show floor is a wireless solution. Right. Um, it's come a long way. It's, it's not the same as Wi-Fi, it's a different wireless solution. And I tell you, the speeds that we're seeing out of there definitely beat the two-wire in the conversion. Mm -hmm. um, but there's just a, there's a lot of choices now with technology. So going back, you have to look and work with your authorized service technicians to see what's best for you. Converting that two-wire, the Cat5, or maybe a wireless solution might also be a, a, a solution for you. And I would note that, that um, one of the things that we that is not talked about a lot around the EMV upgrades is the fact that if you're not going to go with EMV upgrades at your fuel dispensers, you have to put in triple DES encryption. So remember back, back in like 2010 when we, we thought we were gonna have to do triple DES inside and outside, but it's just inside. Okay, so you either have to do your EMV upgrades or you're gonna have to upgrade your fuel dispensers to triple DES if you wanna continue accepting pin debit. Any other questions? All right, well then we'll close this out. Um, you will get a survey and it's four questions. Once you complete the survey, oh, and you have to complete it for each session you attend. And then once you complete the survey, they're gonna email the deck out to you. I believe that's not going out until next Monday, um, but you'll have that. Um, there are recordings available and you can go to the registration counter located in Westgate to inquire about that. And then finally, here's our contact information. I'll leave this up. Again, we're gonna be down in the booth 6147. Please feel free to stop by there or contact any one of us and we'll be happy to give you some more information. Thank you very much for attending.